years, you've managed to unseal the library. Why don't you come inside for a story? Welcome, listener, to the Lore Hall Library Podcast. <laughs> Library presents Ella's Room, written and narrated by Wentz Hesselman. They told me my name is Jacob. I don't know if that's the name my birth parents gave me, or if that's just what they started calling me. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if I was dropped off without a name people that just give a baby up the day that it's born, well, they don't strike me as the type to pick out a name. I've been in the foster system all my life. To be honest, I see it as an extension of urban waste disposal. I don't know how many times I've been looked at, checked out, and then put back, like a pair of gloves that just didn't fit. Orphans and foster kids are kind of like the plastic in the landfill. We're going to be around for a while, but in the meantime, nobody knows what to do with us. They told me that I act out too much. Who was I trying to impress? My parents? They threw me away before they had any idea of what I was like. I had no idea how love even belonged in a world that provides such convenient means of throwing other human beings away. Foster homes, divorce, homeless shelters. I guess my attitude was bad enough that they decided my chances of being adopted were at an all-time low, because they sent me someplace that kids went but never left. St. Marianas. The first thing I had noticed about the place was that it was old. Missing ceiling tiles. Patches of peeling paint like sunburnt skin. Cobwebs fluttering like seaweed off of sconces for candles. The second thing I noticed was that St. Marianas had been several other things before it had been an orphanage. Stale blood from its past bled through. Some rooms had antiquated medical equipment, which either pointed to caring for the elderly or caring for the insane. Other rooms had chalkboards that were graying out with dust. Classrooms, perhaps? I was marched in when I was eight years old. The broad hand of a nun was at my back, pushing me forward and threatening to pitch me to the hardwood floor if I got out of line. Her other hand held up a crooked cigarette. Something told me I didn't want to see her upset. For a place that supposedly housed children, it was terribly quiet. The only thing I could really hear was a radio or a television drifting from somewhere. The hum of flies came from a wastebasket just inside a doorway as we passed. A few turns and stairwells later, I was pushed forward through a set of double doors that divided a long hallway in half. This is the wing for new arrivals. If you find yourself in a room that isn't in this wing, then you're in the wrong part of the building. No noise, no troublemaking. Are we clear? I nodded. I said, are we clear? Oh, right. She was one of those. Yes, ma'am. I had just worked up the courage to ask which room was mine when the old double doors had already clacked shut with an echo. I looked around. A small girl, 
further down the wing disappeared when I spotted her, retreating into a room and shutting the door. The silence was especially deep where I stood. I wasn't sure if they were being so quiet just for me, or if that's just the way things were. It hit me how tired I was. My rucksack barely had anything in it, but it felt heavy. Like my arms, and my legs, and my eyelids. I went up and down the hall surveying the doors. It had more rooms than I thought. One after the other was shut, and I was afraid that none of them would be vacant. I was even more afraid that I'd end up at the far end of the wing where light somehow didn't quite reach. Shadows pooled there, and looking at it made my skin prickle. The array of closed doors brought me near that end, and I found myself hearing my own heartbeat. But there in the middle of the hallway was a door that was ajar. I cautiously peered in. It didn't look lifted, not recently. Cold, dead radiators held the walls up. A motionless ceiling fan hung at a strange angle, like the neck of a hung man. The bed was anything but clean, but it was a bed. I set my rucksack down, and I sat on the bed, and that's the last thing I remember. Next thing I knew, I was being smacked across the forehead. My vision settled on the biggest, meanest-looking girl I had ever seen. She had dirt smudges on one cheek, and her hair was short and black. She may have been my age, but the face was too babyish. If she was younger than me, she was huge for her age. Either she bullied the other kids around, or she ate them. "'What are you doing in my room?' she yelled with a shrill and nasal voice. "'I didn't know this was anyone's room,' I said. "'Well, you can't have this one.' "'I need a room, too,' I snapped back. Her beefsteak arm reached across the bed and grabbed me by the hair. Next thing I knew, I was being dragged out of the bed. Let me just say that being dragged by the hair right after being torn from a dead sleep is pretty painful. I was launched into the hallway and I face-planted against the opposite wall. I was conscious just long enough to feel my rucksack hit me. I glitched in and out of sleep a few times, mostly when I heard the sound of doors opening and closing all around me. The sounds of small feet dashed around me as if I were a snoozing guard dog. A few times I heard voices. None of them sounded like grown-ups. By the time I could open my eyes without triggering a huge migraine, I had somehow gotten all the way to the far end of the hallway. Yes, that end. The creepy one. It terminated in two blank walls and only one door. When I looked at where the floor met the wall where a door should have been, I realized that there had been a door there before, but it was plastered over. The gap underneath the entombed door was plain as day, eaten away by moisture and rodents. I could see the glow of twilight leaking from under that opening. It hurt to move, but the hallway was getting colder. No sooner had I propped myself up than a small student's chalkboard slid out to me from under the sealed door, and this made every hair on my body stand on end. It simply said, Hello. I looked down the hallway. I was alone 
and it was dead silent. Um, hello? I said out loud. There was no answer. A small compartment with a magnetic lid had a stub of dirty white chalk inside. I pushed the whole thing back through the opening. I heard the sound of chalk tapping away on the chalkboard. It slid back out again. You can have the room behind you, it said. I strained to turn my head over my shoulder where a door presented itself. Are you sure? I asked. Again, no answer, but then I pushed the chalkboard underneath the gap. There was more furious tapping. When the chalkboard came back, it said, Yes, nobody wants it. How come? I asked. I caught myself waiting, and I again pushed the chalkboard back underneath. More tapping. It came back. Because of me, it said. There was a click from behind, and it may as well have been a gunshot. I nearly went through the ceiling. The door behind me had opened a few inches. If I hadn't been nursing a concussion, I would have taken off running and screaming. I just didn't have it in me. I returned the chalkboard and asked, Who are you? Ella was the written answer. I nodded with tightened lips. Ella! Yep, okay! I had more questions, like, when do we get to eat? But I didn't feel comfortable asking Ella about those things. I would process everything later, for then I just needed to get out of the cold, creepy hallway. The room was truly vacant. I could tell that nobody was using it, and I could somehow tell that nobody wanted to. It wasn't comfortable, but just knowing that I wouldn't be assaulted while sleeping was enough. I slept better than I had planned. My head wasn't throbbing too badly in the morning. It wasn't the first bully I had dealt with in an orphanage, so I wasn't that worked up over it. But I wasn't prepared to see that burly girl first thing when I stepped out into the hallway. She was some distance away, but even then I could see the shock on her face. Her pale skin grew a shade whiter. Then her features scrunched in childish disgust. Just what kind of freak are you, huh? Sleeping in that room? She growled. Ella said I could have that room, so don't act like you own the place. Her eyes got as wide as dinner plates, and she retreated to her room and slammed the door. The smoking nun finally came and summoned us all to breakfast. That's when I got to see just how many kids there really were. The hallway felt quite crowded, but you'd never have known they were there from the quiet. Pig Girl was the last to come out, and she regarded me with a wariness that I could appreciate. The only good thing about breakfast was that it was food. After that, there was work to be done. I was selected to chop wood with a much smaller boy named Byron. He didn't say much. He set the wood up on the stump, and I brought the axe down. Sometimes he'd get distracted and daydream, and I'd stand waiting for more wood. He'd snap out of wherever he was and jump back into form. He acted every bit like someone was going to hit him when he caught himself daydreaming. But I didn't see that anyone was watching us. I started to slack a bit myself. So when the wind made the wooden shed door slam shut, I was towing a line right along with Byron. But then I saw it was the wind, and that kind of relief feels so good. 
and after the fourth or fifth false alarm, I propped the door shut with a log. What happened next was worse than the wind. It was when the breeze died down that I heard it. That tapping sound of chalk on a chalkboard. I turned around and saw the small chalkboard slide under the door of the shed, and I felt like my heart had shriveled up and dropped down into my stomach. It said, I'm cold. I didn't see the chalkboard when I had propped the door shut. I opened it. There was nothing there. I looked over at Byron, and he was more distracted than ever. I placed the chalkboard back inside the shed, looking at it with a sour face. I propped the door shut again. The chalkboard slid out just a few seconds later. I'm cold, it said again, but in larger letters. <laughs> this was getting nuts. Where's your blanket? I whispered as I pushed the little tablet back, sure that I wouldn't be heard. But it came back out, saying, It wore out. I need a new one. Oh, yeah? Do you want me to stuff one under the door when I get back inside? No. Bring me the knife inside this shed. Th the what? Top shelf. Back against the wall where you can't see it. For sure that I would be spotted, I went inside the shed and used the prop log to stand on. Just within reach was a rusty buck knife that must have been sitting there for years. I carefully put it in my pocket. Instead of being terrified, I was confused. I closed up the shed again and slid the tablet back under the door. I was about to take up the axe when I saw Byron staring straight at me. His look was accusing. I didn't know if he saw the tablet, the knife, or both. He scooched the log out of the way and opened the door to look inside. His puzzled expression remained. The dinner bell rang, and he ran off. Like a criminal double-checking the scene of a crime, I couldn't resist one last look inside the shed. The little chalkboard was nowhere to be seen. Our meals were shared together at a long, antique table that would have had some character if it weren't for all the splinters. Nobody sat with Pig Girl. She was clearly an object of avoidance. The kicker was that she now felt that way about me. She was even leaning away from me. We were nowhere near each other, not even on the same side of the table. I was feeling good about the level of respect I was getting, when I heard a sound that made my blood run cold. Metal clattering onto the floor directly under me. I leaned to see what it was, praying that it wasn't what I suspected. Oh, it was. There was the buck knife on the floor. On instinct, I glanced up. Pig girl was looking under the table, too. She went off like a fire alarm. He's got a knife! He's got a knife! He's going to give Ella a knife! He's been talking to Ella! She's making him get her a knife! She couldn't stop repeating herself. Every sentence had Ella and knife in it. A couple of nuns stormed towards me like they knew what all her babbling meant. Hand it over immediately, one of them ordered me. I held up both hands, one of them holding a butter knife. 
an explosion rocked my head as I was slapped across the face. Wrinkled, knotted hands pushed into my pockets, my clothing, my socks. They leaned down and looked under the table. One of them turned to Pig Girl and told her that her supper time was officially over. The rage and panic on her face turned her all shades of pale and red until she screamed not a few curse words at me. This performance prompted one of the nuns to grab her by one ear and slap her repeatedly. I was allowed to finish my meal. When I was done, I removed the buck knife from the bottom of the table where I had lodged the tip. <laughs> Pig Girl was watching me when I entered the wing. I was planning on slipping the knife into the condemned room later, but the chalkboard slid out and hit my foot. Give me the knife now, it read. The sudden aggression shocked me, but I obeyed. I placed the knife on the tablet and slid it back under. I looked at Pig Girl. I could tell she wanted to scream. But she also knew that she couldn't afford to. She slammed her door shut and sobbed so loudly that I wondered just what I had gotten involved in. But by then, it was out of my hands. I had no idea. I, uh, I simply had no, uh, no idea. S something happened that night. Uh, at the time, I was yanked out of bed by police officers, and so was everyone else. The nuns were taken away to prison, and us kids, well, we... We were all kicked back into the system. It took a while, but I actually got taken in by a decent family. They weren't perfect, but they treated me like a human being. They wouldn't tell me what happened at St. Mariana's. They wouldn't let me listen to the news reports. They wouldn't let me look at the newspapers. It kind of makes sense now in a way, but they couldn't shield me from the facts forever. With so much of my life spent in the foster system, I began gathering material to write my memoir, and following the breadcrumbs through my past led me to St. Mariana's. The place was condemned and boarded up, which didn't stop me at all. I got in with the help of the wood axe that was still by the firewood. There wasn't much to see. No juicy tidbits had been left behind from which I could extract any storytelling. But I did notice that in the wing where all us kids stayed, the door that had been plastered over was uncovered. I couldn't resist. It was another bedroom. It somehow felt older than the rest of the place. All furniture was reduced to splinters and dust. The mattress was gone. The ceiling looked like it was ready to collapse. There was an odor to the room that bothered me, but the reason why was outside of my conscious mind. I was a little disappointed that there wasn't anything left behind that could fill in the gaps about the place and explain why I was whisked away in the night all those years ago. I stepped out into the hallway and shut the once invisible door behind me. There was the sound of something sliding underneath the door and something solid hit my left heel. Let me tell you, 
That was a feeling of fear that defies all sane description. I turned around. It was that student's chalkboard. Except it had a stained and warped manila envelope on top of it. My hands shook as I read the chalkboard, which said, Thank you. I'm very warm now. The envelope was full of photos. After seeing just one of them, I thought it best that I sit down. They were crime scene photographs, apparently taken inside the sealed room. The ongoing theme in all of them was blood. Lots of it. There was one photograph of what looked like a blood-soaked blanket, but then I saw that the blanket had a face attached to it, loose and folded. It was Pig Girl's face. It was attached to Pig Girl's skin. Then there was a photo of the buck knife. Several photos, apparently taken in rapid succession, showed investigators removing something from the flayed skin. It was one of those antique porcelain dolls. The face was badly cracked and fractured. Its hair, its clothes, were flat with the weight of the blood. The elegant ballroom dress had a name embroidered at the bottom by the thing's feet. And the name was legible. Spelled out in fancy, swirling cursive was the name Ella. Do you hear that? The books are wanting to know how you felt about your visit to our little establishment. Please, give us a like and a subscribe. If your platform for listening to podcasts gives you a chance to offer a comment, we welcome that as well. All credits are in the show notes. Please, come back again soon.